A very warm welcome to you all this afternoon. We're delighted to see you here. I think other people are joining us now. My name is Chris Doyle. I'm the director of CARBU. And before I hand over to Christian Oruxen to, to chair this afternoon's proceedings, uh, just to say, first of all, um, if you are not a member of CARBU, we very much hope that you you will join us and become a member. We very much love to welcome you on board and hope that you'll come to future events. And when talking about future events, just a little advert. On Monday, we have a panel discussion on online again uh, on the issue of the, the killing of Shreen Abu Akhle, the Al Jazeera journalist who was killed in Jenin on the 11th of May. We have a great panel, including the uh, freshly appointed UN rapporteur on, on the occupied territories, as well as a, an Al Jazeera producer from Ramallah who worked with her for 15 years uh, and others as well. So please do sign up for that if you haven't. Um, without further ado, though, I'm going to hand over to Christian and uh, just also to welcome uh, Matt Hedges. Um, it is really poignant for, for us all really to, to see him here with us because, you know, there was a time a few years ago when we were working very hard in Parliament to get him released and we're just so glad that he is and uh, he is out because for those of you who are aware of what happened to him, it was, you know, truly awful. And I'm really glad to say there were so many politicians, MPs, Lords who, who did press the government to, to, to make an effort when the whole thing became public. So we're really, really pleased to see you here and to see uh, really the fruits of your PhD being published now. But that's all I've got to say uh, on that issue. I'm going to pass over to uh, Christian Coates Oriksen, who I cannot imagine a, a better chair to sort of guide us through this and to have a conversation with Matt today. Thank you both very much for doing this. Well, thank you very much, Chris, for organizing this event, and thank you all for attending. My name is Christian Ulrichsen. I'm at Rice University in Houston in the US, and it's a great pleasure today to be talking to Matt Hedges about his new book, Reinventing the Sheikhdom, Clan, Power, and Patronage in Mohammed bin Zayed's UAE. The book came out in December 2021, published by FIRST, which was six months before the passing of Sheikh Khalifa bin Zayed al Nahyan, the president of the UAE and the ruler of Abu Dhabi. Uh, his death was announced on the 13th of May and was followed by the smooth succession of his younger half-brother, Mohammed bin Zayed, the focus of Matt's book, uh, who was uh, proclaimed or elected president of the UAE the following day on the 14th of May. So Matt's book does a, a very detailed job of examining many of the changes in the UAE <clears throat> over the past seven years, because Sheikh Khalifa, uh, while president on paper and in title, had suffered a serious stroke in January 2014, had largely withdrawn from public life, and so the succession, as it were, had unfolded gradually over a period of seven years and more before it was formalized in, in May with Sheikh Khalifa's passing and Mohammed bin Zayed's accession, his smooth accession, I should note. So Matt and I will have a conversation for about 20 to 30 minutes, and then we'll open it up to uh, questions from the audience. So if you want to ask a question, please uh, notify us in the chat box. Um, I'll just begin by introducing Matt. Matt's uh, an academic focusing on authoritarian regimes with an emphasis on the monarchies of the Arabian Peninsula. And as Chris said, while conducting fieldwork research for his PhD in the UAE in 2018, he was arrested and sentenced to life imprisonment under the charge of espionage. He was released after a public campaign and outcry and awarded his doctorate by Durham University. And this book is the published version of that doctorate. So without further ado, Matt, thanks again for being with us. Perhaps I could begin by asking you how Sheikh Khalifa, the president of the UAE from 2004 until this past month, 
how Sheikh Khalifa structured power in the UAE, and what changes have already been seen since his stroke in 2014. <clears throat> so uh, without trying to uh, repeat it too much, I'd like to thank Christian, Chris, and, and Kabu and everybody else here in attendance um, for, for, for making time today. So Sheikh Khalifa's reign was largely an extension of, of his father's. Uh, under Sheikh Zayed, there was a, there was a, a need to balance the, uh, the different social requirements of, of you know, the, the, the different layers of society to make sure that tribes were represented, to make sure that there was mutual development across the, the entire federation. Um, and I think it's important to emphasize the fact that the UAE is a federation of, of, of seven emirates. Power is, is constitutionally shared, um, yet there is a degree of independence between them which underwrites and you know, really supports the, uh, the identity, the social identity of Emiratis and the UAE. This is both in a, a, at an Emirate level, but then one at a national level. Um, and a Sheikh Khalifa, that this was continued, although Abu Dhabi's presence uh, across the UAE uh, significantly increased. Um, this, sort of, this sort of course, largely down to their, um, the profits from, their, uh, from oil and gas, from the use of the, the funds, um, but as well as the, the growing uh, bureaucracy, um, you know, the, the construction and development of new ministries, the expansion, of government organizations and the um, that growing role within society itself. Um, but this was then, as, as we said, there have been changes going on for, for, for nearly two decades, quite in the background. And this was largely down to the, the presence of Mohammed bin Zayed, uh, as we've said. He, was appointed crown prince um, underneath uh, his, his elder brother, Sheikh Khalifa. He is the third son of Sheikh Zayed, and so actually took a, a seat or a position, if you were, to go through uh, primogeniture. He was ahead of his second elder brother, uh, Sheikh Sultan. Um, there are uh, reports that he, um, he had drug and alcohol abuse and had been uh, put out of family life um, several years earlier. And so Mohammed bin Zayed was in parallel, he, he was creating a, a different sort of structure, a, a different state that was um, not subservient to him, but that owed its allegiance to him. And you can see this through certain uh, institutions such as Mubadla. You can see this through the, the, the entirety of the security apparatus, both the UA Armed Forces, the State Security Department, and other uh, Minister of Interior um, entities, because of his position, his leadership within them, the creation of these uh, groups, but then the, um, the <laughs> pardon me, it's then the, like the sponsorship, it is the, it's the, it's the nurturing of those elite relationships so that it, it becomes very uh, patriarchal. It's, it's a, they're very vertical entities. He enables certain elites, persons that are close to him, and in turn, uh, they, they, they manage uh, those networks um, again for him. Um, this is something you see across the entirety of the state. And this really is, in summary, where that changes between uh, and, and then bin Zayed. But again, as you noted yourself, not something that could tonight. Uh, thank you, Matt. Um, we're having trouble hearing you. I wonder if you might turn your video off, perhaps? Or, okay, we are, you're back now. Um, mm -hmm. As you say, the Sheikh Khalifa had his stroke in 2014, but you alluded to the centralization and consolidation of power within Abu Dhabi and within the circle around Mohammed bin Zayed. 
And to what extent was that also a byproduct of events like the 2008-2009 financial crisis, which uh, perhaps uh, reigned in Dubai's uh, influence within the Federation to some extent, and also to the Arab Spring, which uh, led to a much more security-focused approach to policymaking, because they had both happened before 2014. Do you think they were also important markers on this road towards a much more centralized state? Sure. So, absolutely, the, the, the centralization occurred, but on, again, on two levels. Within the Federation, as you noted, the, the financial crash, um, it required a, a stronger um, formalized leadership of Abu Dhabi. But this was occurring, you know, we saw this in, in foreign policy, we saw this in economics and industry and development, but this was a was not so much of an unspoken rule, but it, it was acknowledged and notified from this point onwards, from 2008. That centralization, however, also occurred within Abu Dhabi and the uh, elites that uh, Sheikh Khalifa had structured around him. So when I mentioned the continuation of, of those elite circles, the, the acknowledgement of tribal and social links that Khalifa managed, this process then sharply changed. Um, in 2011, at the, the following the Arab Spring, and before and after Sheikh Khalifa's stroke, uh, and this consolidation of power then grew on. So in, in, in my research, I, I highlight these changes and this to acknowledge both on, on a tribal level, um, but there's also then a technocratic and personal link and connection um, directly to, to Muhammad bin Zayed. He brought up people that he had previously worked with that were trusted to him um, and they then bring with them, the, 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 that is that continuation of, the, of their personal network. So if they worked together in the Air Force, or if they worked together at GHQ, if they worked together in economic diversification within Abu Dhabi and the UAE, as, as that sea level of authority and power rose, they all benefited from it. And you can see this within the Abu Dhabi Executive Council, within the Supreme Petroleum Committee, within the Abu Dhabi, Execu uh, Abu Dhabi Executive Council, Abu Dhabi Investment Authority, um, Supreme Petroleum Committee, and, and, and several other institutions that were, that were illustrations of, of that significant power change. Um, yeah. Well, now that uh, Mohammed bin Zayed is, we kept saying for years he was de facto ruler, now he is the ruler of Abu Dhabi, by extension, the president of the UAE. He's only 61 years old, so he could quite easily play a dominant role in domestic and regional politics for at least another 20 years, if not more. So how will Mohammed bin Zayed's reign be defined? Sure. It's, it's <clears throat> if you look at his background, if you look at what he's been doing for the past um, just under 10 years, this is the evidence that we can uh, build upon to, to look at, and it's there is a high degree of assertiveness. Um, Mohammed bin Zayed had, had enjoyed working quietly. He he favoured being the, the crown prince because it gave him uh, degrees of, of flexibility. Um, there, there was a way in which you could palm off uh, decision making to, to somebody else, but really he, he it was the driving force behind it. Now, as leader of the state, of, 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 of the unified state, he then has to not only translate his message, but also um, um, get people to, to buy into the legitimacy of what he is desiring. So when we talk about, say, um, stabilization at the cost of personal liberty, um, talk about uh, political Islam, you look at the, the shift from uh, a, maybe a, a Western dominated foreign policy to one that is much more open uh, to Russia, to China, um, and adventurous into Africa. This is something that um, is seen as a, 
it's part of a global trend that the UA is in um, is at the forefront of. You know, they 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 were some of the the leading actors, the the authors of the uh, normalization with Israel, and you know that this is politically calculated. Um, this this is something deliberately designed um, to 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 strategically enhance their regional, but also international position and power. Um, quite a simple way, it's real politique, but um, it, 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 it's, it's quite sophisticated in the way that they're going to do it. Um, and Mohammed bin Zayed, he, he has shown, however, in the past to be somewhat inflexible, to be quite, um, it's that security military background um, could maybe have made it harder for decisions to be made. Um, and, and, and this this might, however, this heavy approach could um, could produce some difficulties internally uh, in the future. Well, we'll come to those in a second, but we have seen over the past year, at least in outwardly, a, a shift in the UAE towards a more pragmatic turn in their regional and foreign policy, which is the broader context to which Mohammed bin Zayed now has become head of state. I mean, is that evidence that there is at least a pragmatic streak that does run through policy that in a sense when they realize that maybe policies such as back in Khalifa Haftar in Libya or the decision making in Yemen when when things aren't producing results any longer that they desire they do have the capacity to recognize that and change course is that something you would recognize um they, they, they have certainly been able to um, to ride pressures. And again, we can see that with, with their, the evolution of their position towards Russia in the war in Ukraine. It starts off, you know, um, failing to condone uh, the violence, the invasion uh, and the war. And as that outcry has grown, so has their position. Um, they have now, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go as far as to say fallen in line, but they are now seemingly on, on a similar page to uh, too many supporters of Ukraine. Um, this is something that's been strategically and tactically analyzed, um, but they have walked back their position. Um, when it comes to, to say, Libya and Yemen, um, again, th these are not short-term investments of theirs. They, they have been planning these for, 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 for many years. And if maybe Haftar fails, if the STC were to fail in Yemen, there would just be uh, other avenues that they would look to explore. Um, I'm not so sure that they would just pick up and, and, and move on, but they would uh, try and find another way to, to, you know, to reap the rewards of, of that pressure. And in terms of the UAE as a whole, which you've touched upon, as you say, the UAE is a Federation of Seven Emirates. Abu Dhabi is by far the largest and by virtue of its having 90% of the oil reserves, the most uh, important economically, especially since Dubai uh, influence was to some extent curtailed after 2009. What does this mean for, for the union, for the UAE and the much more centralized Abu Dhabi control? I mean, it has been 50 years, the UAE marked its 50th anniversary at the end of last year. So memories of the independent Emirates are, are fading. But, and of course, memories of Sheikh Zayed himself are probably fading too. In a sense, it's almost 20 years now since Sheikh Zayed passed away. So we are moving into a genuinely post Zayed moment. So what does it mean, I think, for, for the UAE now that MBZ is, is head of state? Well, I think you've hit the nail on the head. It's the, you know, the father of the nation, Sheikh Zayed, the mother of the nation, Sheikh Fatima, and the, 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 these, this discourse, this identity, it, it points very deliberately then to Muhammad bin Zayed, um, to, to his leadership and vision, the fact that Emiratis must undertake national service, to which he is seen as, you know, as the former chief of staff of the, of the military. Emiratis have to, for the large, um, large portion, have to travel to Abu Dhabi, for, for work in the private in the public sector where 98 in 98 percent of emiratis work it, it shows a a very clear uh focus and orientation towards abu dhabi 
you then balance this alongside the that evolution, that change in, in identity and leadership from the previous generation. Look at the, uh, and compare the leadership and authority shown, say by Mohammed bin Zayed, both within the UAE and internationally, and compare that with Mohammed bin Rashid and his conduct um, in the last several years. Um, his, his involvement in, in legal cases, He's been found uh, guilty of, of harassing his, his ex-wife and several other events. Um, then who would succession go to in Dubai? His sons do not have anywhere near the same profile as anyone uh, remotely close to Mohammed bin Zayed. This is then you know, furthered in, in, in Sharjah, Najman, in Russell Kama and Fujairah, um, and Omar Quain. It's it's a it's not so much that someone's there to, to uh, compete against that union, to compete against that consolidation of power, but there is nothing to offset the, that concentration. So it, it will simply accelerate. And well, I have a question about succession after the MBZ, who of course hasn't yet announced the crown prince. There's no recent precedent for that time frame in the sense that in 2003, James Ayat had appointed Mohammed bin Zayed, deputy crown prince, which meant he then was elevated automatically to crown prince. And in 1966, when Sheikh Zayed had become ruler himself, he took three years to appoint uh, Sheikh Khalifa, his own crown prince, perhaps because Sheikh Khalifa turned 21 in 1969. But what about succession management in terms of what happens next? And that ties into a point in the chat by HC, which makes the point that Sheikh Khalifa's mother was the only one of Sheikh Zayed's wives from the al Mahyan family, which was a critical point in his state consolidation. But do you think dynastic unity is a concern or no longer a concern, perhaps? No, it, it, it's, a, it's an absolute uh, excellent point that Sheikh Khalifa retains that unified, or he retained the unified um, family blood, if you, for a better or worse term. Um, in it, the Anahian ruling family in Abu Dhabi, it, it's not as large as, as the Al Saud. Um, again, the precedent for the policy of, say, primogenitor, um, if it were to be implemented, um, I think it would be uh, Hamdan bin Zayed, who is again a, a full brother of Muhammad bin Zayed. Um, but this would forego any uh, state building that Muhammad bin Zayed has been undertaking, as well as the fact that Hamdan bin Zayed has, has been very quiet within domestic politics for, for several years. Uh, that does seem unlikely to be the case. Um, as well as the fact that Sheikh Sultan bin Zayed, again, was also uh, bypassed for power. So there is not that same precedent um, there. The, as, as, as most people here might know, and if not, Mohammed bin Zayed and, uh, and his six brothers, they have, they, they share that same eternal link. And by creating and being part of a, a unique family block within the Anahian ruling family, it's, a, it's an elevated level of, of power consolidation. Um, this may help with rule, this may help with authority and, and to create this new uh, foundation. But when we mention that, that, that concentration and consolidation of power within Abu Dhabi, this is then further strained by that extra uh, concentration within a, within a biological unit. And the, the, you know, the predominant options for succession or to, to, to be the deputy of, of MBZ are his eldest son, uh, Sheikh Khaled, who is the, the Minister of State Security and he is the Deputy National Security Advisor. And then his... Uh, second brother, um, Sheikh Tahnoun, uh, the, the, the third Bani Fatima son, who is the national security advisor. And uh, you know, he, he's someone who, again, like MBZ in, in recent years, has really um, walked out from behind a curtain um, to, to illustrate and demonstrate his power and authority, uh, both domestically and internationally. Yes, I think it's worth uh, remembering that the three 
players in golf politics today, Mohammed bin Zayed in Abu Dhabi, Mohammed bin Salman in Saudi Arabia, and Emir Tamim in Qatar, and none of those were the firstborn sons. And in fact, all of them were sons of the previous ruler's favorite wife. And I think that plays a, a critical role, at least in some of these dynamics, which we'll have to see how they play out. But one of the defining features of Abu Dhabi's policies over the past 10 years as the consolidation and of authority by Mohammed bin Zayed that you've described has played out has been the relentless focus on the Muslim Brotherhood and on Islam and Islamism. And can you explain why the UAE under Mohammed bin Zayed has focused so heavily on this issue? Um, the, the, the... They would explain it as um, the, the Muslim Brotherhood, and it, it is a um, it is a violent ideology. It is one that promotes violence, that it promotes um, it, it, it doesn't conform to the modern image of the UAE. Um, that they see it as understandably as as maybe a terrorist organization. Um, seen another way, it is a um, it is a potential threat to the to the institution of a monarchy that would seek to bypass the entire uh, social structure um, of the community of the state, uh, both of the citizens and the, the non-citizens, um, and it it goes to the extent that it it could be seen as a irrational uh, threat. But this is a threat that they um, perceive regardless. This is this is their own uh, issue with it. And you know, responses at a quiet level, you can see down to the the the, the Ministry of Religious Affairs, the Alkaf. They um, they publish, they centrally publish the Friday sermons and they disseminate them to mosques. This means that if you go to a mosque in Abu Dhabi, one in Ras al-Khaimah, uh, wherever you are across the country, theoretically, you should be receiving the exact same government-controlled uh, uh, sermon. Um, of course, there, there are other issues uh, with that, but this is designed to, to try and nullify that political legitimacy that, that the Muslim Brotherhood might try and um, engage with in the UAE. Because I've sometimes wondered to what extent the focus or the sense of concern and unease about the Brotherhood is rooted in the fact that the UAE is a collection, as you say, of seven emirates. Five of the emirates lack the resources of Abu Dhabi and Dubai, are perhaps perceived as more conservative in some ways. And to what extent do people like Mohammed bin Zayed think that Historically speaking, at least, uh, Ras al-Khaimah and other parts of the UAE have been at least receptive to uh, the Muslim Brotherhood. I mean, could they ever become a, a threat or has that threat been nullified or perhaps preempted in you know, the sense is that uh, you know, they don't even want to wait for a threat to materialize before they engage with it? I think that was a lesson from, from 2011, that uh, if you wait too long, you, you, you risk losing control. I, I wouldn't, I would disagree by saying that Abu Dhabi is also quite conservative. When, when you think of Abu Dhabi, it is not just the city, it's also the emirate. Um, and so if you were to go uh, out, outside of the capital city, again, it is, it is um, there is a social conservatism that, that, that still emanates. Um, I, I, I don't believe the, the, the Muslim Brotherhood ideology is, 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 uh, is particularly deep within Emirati society. Um, the, the problem is we're having this discussion about say the Ihwan, the Muslim Brotherhood, but this has been rolled up and this is the, the all encompassing definition for anything that could be perceived to be in slight opposition to the state. Um, any form of, of, of political or social liberalism that goes against the state narrative. And th this is where it gets a little bit um, it gets harder to to engage with because um, it, I, I I wouldn't say that the Muslim Brotherhood ideology is is particularly prominent in say Russell Hamer, but.
but calls for, for greater political and social mobility um, are. Um, but that, that, that's very obviously very hard to define. It's very hard to, to, to measure. Well, one of the uh, flashpoints perhaps in the UAE UK relationship over the past 10 years, apart from your own case, of course, in 2018, did come in around 2012, 13, 14, when uh, the issue of the Muslim Brotherhood and the UK government report by Sir John Jenkins was something that was causing a degree of concern in, in the UAE. We saw lobbying, I think, from the UAE over, over that issue on, on David Cameron's government. How do you assess the UAE-UK relationship at this point in time? We have seen signs that it may not be as strong as it has been. Uh, of course, we see also the UAE being quite, uh, the, the relationship with the US also being under a degree of strain as well. But in terms of the UK, how do you assess the British and the Russian relationship right now? Um, for, for several years, it's been quite poor. Um, I say, I, I use the word poor uh, by comparison to what it had been uh, previously. Um, there are firstly that those formal uh, state relations and engagements, uh, th these seem to have bounced back uh, recently. There, there seems to be an uptake in cooperation and engagement. But personally speaking, the, the, the dynamics between elite figures and rulers is following a, a somewhat negative trend. Um, there had been strong relations with with Muhammad, with Muhammad bin Rashid, but again, he he's he's fallen uh, very quickly um, from the forefront, and he, he you know he's not uh, he's not young. He will he, he won't stay in power for too long. Um, but his sons don't have the same aura and charisma as him, and so that that may not mean much in the future. When it comes to Muhammad bin Zayed and, and, and the persons around him. They don't either um, sustain a, or have a, have that close relationship um, as they might do in other countries. Um, Mahal bin Zayed did, did have a strong working relationship with Boris Johnson when he was the foreign secretary um, on several trips. They, they had that, that close personal dynamic. Um, and maybe this was illustrated when uh, MBZ visited London last year. Um, but again, it, it's, it's the it's the additional baggage that comes with them at the moment. And they, they've tried to keep quiet um, for, for several years to, to avoid further um, negative uh, press. But, um, you know, it, 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 it's quite low uh, still. Well, of course, the coverage of the High Court judgments over Mohammed bin Rashid was certainly something that I think has created a an image problem, at least in terms of Mohammed bin Rashid. Of course, he had been very much part of the uh, sort of establishment, so to speak. And uh, as you say, that's going to be difficult, perhaps, to to resurrect. Although, perhaps, again, consolidation of power in Abu Dhabi means that, uh, uh, as you say, he's seventy-four years old as well. Uh, in terms of the international relationships of the UAE, I mean, we've seen the frosty relations with the US over over Russia and Ukraine and over the oil price for the Saudis as well, in terms of uh, being more assertive in putting their own interests first and in effectively telling the US or the West that we won't pick sides, we won't necessarily follow what you tell us to say or do. I mean, how does that tie into the broader shifts in UAE international relations, especially relations with China? We saw last year some of the sensitivities over the Chinese relationship with the Wall Street Journal, I think, reporting about the construction of some naval facility in Abu Dhabi. Um, we see obviously with Russia, Ukraine, Russia being very close. So Ahmed Bin Zayed has been speaking with Vladimir Putin, hasn't necessarily spoken too frequently with Joe Biden. Is this just part of the diversification of international relationships of the UAE preparing for a future, perhaps also with Israel, with the Abraham Accords, where the US is no longer the kind of most reliable long-term partner. Are they trying to diversify in that respect? So on the one hand, the 
<clears throat> the UAE got, got massively burnt, um, the, the fingers burnt, the perception was damaged uh, following the Arab Spring and, and, and seeing um, Mubarak being ousted in, in Egypt without any external support from you know, predominantly uh, Washington. And afterwards, there's been a series of, of failing, um, failing democratic leadership. There's been a loss of trust in governance and authority. Um, in that trust, in that continuity. But there's a degree of stabilization that has emanated from, from Moscow, from, from, from Beijing and, and other parts where that same level of judgment doesn't occur. Um, so there has been an expansion, there has been a proliferation of, of international relations. This has come alongside that change in executive leadership uh, within Abu Dhabi, there, there's an increased confidence and assertiveness there. Um, it, it's one thing to, to talk about trying to, to multiply those external backers and sources of, of, of support and strength, but it, it it still seems like an extremely long shot that they would make such a such an assertive move if if they are as as Anwar Gagash said that they're being increasingly forced to choose between the West and China. If they are explicitly stating it in those terms, that is the the measurement by which they should be put against. You are then either with the West or you're with China and Russia. Um, and there obviously it's a bargaining tactic to try and get more resources, more support. Um, let, 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 let's see, there, there, there are obviously perceptions that there is a case to be made to move away. Um, and you, could, you can to a degree understand it, you can. Well, yes, and all Gulf countries to some extent are hedging their bets and also trying to balance very different relationships, which could become more difficult in a much more polarized international context of greater power rivalries and strategic competition. So that could be something that is more difficult now than it has been until, until this point. There's a question from Heinrich about renewable energy, and that was the focus of MBZ's visit to London last year. And of course, the UAE is also going to host the COP in 2023, the climate change uh, annual meeting. Um, why do you think the UAE is focusing so strongly on renewable energy, thinking back to the MASTA initiative and IRENA, the International Renewable Energy Agency based in Abu Dhabi since 2009? Is it pragmatic due to Western shifts on this sector? Is it to project business interests? Is it to try and stay ahead of the energy transition, whatever that may be in practice, to be proactive? What, what's your assessment? I. I... I personally, um, I interpret it as a as a perception of their um, they, they understand the the narratives and the discourse of of the international commercial arena of the of governments of states, and it's a desire to actually um, illustrate their the modernity to say uh, we are we are moving forward with this. Look at us. We are uh, we are at the forefront of this. We are fostering this. You know that Mazda is, is is a great example of this. It's you know it's a huge solar solar panel field uh, in Abu Dhabi, but it it's a costly mistake. It it, it doesn't work efficiently. Um, the technology is 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 inefficient. Um, the illustration, the 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 attempt is 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 applauded. It is absolutely it's great to do this. By doing so, they would also make more resources available to sell. Um, but there's a, there doesn't seem to be the same uh, pursuit of, of, of real development uh, within this sector. Um, the, the, uh, Sultan al-Jabba who, who led this is, is, I think he's there with the Minister of Oil, 
oil and energy. Um, well, he's the head of ADNO for the Abu Dhabi National Oil Company. He's also minister uh, now, and it, to go from from one from from total renewables to a to a, a non renewable source, it, it 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 seems to be more about the image as opposed to the implementation. Okay, well, we've spoken about the domestic issues and we've spoken about the international issues, which leaves the regional issues. And of course, the UAE is one of six countries in the Gulf Cooperation Council, which has had its deepest uh, internal rift since it was formed in 1981, when the UAE was joined with Saudi Arabia and Bahrain to uh, isolate Qatar between 2017 and 2021. We've had the UAE and Saudi Arabia joining forces in Yemen, although not necessarily as harmoniously as was anticipated. And Mohammed bin Zayed and Mohammed bin Salman, the two crown princes, being seen as being very close. How do you assess that relationship now that one of them is no longer a crown prince, but a head of state? It's, um, yeah, it's a good question because it's, it shouldn't seemingly change anything, but at the same time, it, it changes everything. Um, are, they, are, they, are they equals? Um, are they, um, you know, is, is Mohammed bin Salman a, a shoe in to be the, to be the next king? Um, could, could there be further difficulties within the, within the Saudi royal family um, that, uh, you know, Abu Dhabi could be seen to be a, a principal little instigator of? It's, 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 um, it's unlikely, but, you know, it could happen. They are both figures who are leading um, alongside, as you said, em Emir Tamim, who are, who are leading a, a redevelopment, a, a modernization, a, a growth within the region, uh, an assertiveness that is showing uh, perceived strength, uh, if not literally, at least from their own position. Um, there is, however, a, obviously a shared need to work together. Um, we've seen this, as you said, in Yemen, in, in regards to Qatar and, and some other countries, and. This could potentially bring on, you know, bring normalization across the entire GCC. Um, it, there is still a shared animosity, though. There, there is a degree of uh, mutual, um, a certain perceived risk towards each state. Saudi Arabia has, has, has been expanding its relations with Oman to try and circumvent Emirati influence, to try and reduce some tensions there. Um, you know, that the Saudi, the, the Emiratis work very closely with Bahrain in regards to, say, Israel and, and other areas. Is this uh, in support of? Are they working against um, those shared interests? Um, th th there seem to be more prospects for, for greater unity, but um, of course, when, when politics is that personal, when it's that individual, this can also change very quickly. Well, on that note, the, the Gulf crisis was seen by many as having originated in perhaps personal animosity felt by Mohammed bin Zayed towards the Qataris over many years. Um, we've seen normalization used in relation to Israel, obviously, with, with the Abraham Accords. But we also saw the reconciliation, at least on paper, of the Gulf rift in uh, the Al Ula summit in Saudi Arabia in January 2021. But um, do you think? Now that Mohammed Zayed is head of state in Abu Dhabi in, in the UAE, will that affect in any way the Gulf kind of reconciliation, or has that now moved forward to the point where it's kind of safe to assume that the, the GCC is back? Or how do, how do you see that? No, <laughs> for <laughs> quite quite simply, no. Uh, that, that that competition is of course still there. Um, is it as explosive as it once was? Um, no, there is there is much more unity, at least regionally on, on certain portfolios, but that doesn't mean that they are united. Uh, so the Emiratis have been pushing hard to try and then also enter uh, Afghanistan, at least quite you know delicately, whilst Qatar remains uh, principally involved in this. I used Israel as the example. You can look at the JCPOA and uh, shared threat perceptions towards Iran. Uh, how does Oman and its position towards Iran fit in with this? How does 
Qatar's perceived uh, relationship with Iran affect or influence the UAE and Saudi Arabia's uh, regional threat perception. Um, they may have uh, some successes in certain areas, um, but this doesn't mean that they're united. Thank you. And um, also in terms of normalization, the UAE has taken the lead in 2020. It was followed by, by Bahrain. Do you think that reflects the UAE aspiration to be the regional leader? Uh, obviously, Saudi Arabia hasn't yet uh, reciprocated in terms of normalizing with Israel, but, but do you think that the UAE under Mohammed bin Zayed is going to try to assert for itself the position of regional leader in, in international and regional affairs? And if so, do you think that could lead to issues with, with other countries like Saudi Arabia, for example, when the Qataris tried to be more autonomous, for example, in the 2000s and 2010s, it created a lot of backlash. Uh, do, you, do you see the UAE trying to assume that mantle? The simple answer is, is yes. Um, I, I'm not sure that they would want to, the Emiratis, there is a, a degree of accurate, that the, the self-perception is also realized. They do not have the same capabilities as say Saudi Arabia do to be able to manage um, networks in multiple countries with, with huge numbers of people. And um, we've seen that the difficulties of Saudi Arabia in reconstructing its influence network in Yemen. This is still not, this hasn't been sorted out since the death of Prince Sultan. And this has obviously contributed to a large part to their failings in Yemen. The way that, that Mohammed bin Zayed and, and the people around him work is, is quite um, long-term in mind. They, 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 they build those different blocks, those pieces, um, but it's also heavily centralized. So they will, they will look for certain conduits, they'll look for engagements and, and networks. Um, it's about working together for, for that greater good, but in a very sharp and deliberate manner. Um, they, they will not be able to, to, to lead on multiple different portfolios at different times, but they will, they will throw their lot in at the most opportune moment. Um, I think that's probably the best way to, to see it. Okay, thank you. Well, we have 10 minutes left and there have been a number of questions from the audience about your personal story, of course. People are very interested in what happened to you and how you're, how you're doing today. And we had a question from Rana about your, your journey. How do you get interested in the Middle East and the Gulf? And also, um, what happened to you and how is your life today? It's been three years almost, or coming on to three years in November since you, you were released. So, so broadly speaking, I, um, we lived in the Middle East. We lived in Dubai and, and, and Abu Dhabi for, for several years. We traveled across the region. Um, and then working within the country, I, 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 I was able to... Could see these 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 events occurring. I found it interesting. Um, people that you see when you're a student, you might look at international relations and, and everything else. But actually, I found it fascinating to look at those internal dynamics, to look at those personal relationships. What what was actually happening? The equivalent of the House of Commons, but in you know, in Abu Dhabi or the the equivalent in, in Saudi Arabia. This was a it was another world, you know, to to a, to a young kid. Um, since I've been back, it's, I need to keep myself busy. Um, so I, as you know, I, I finished my PhD. I turned it into a book. I've been teaching at the University of Exeter and Durham University, both with, you know, world leading centers on, on, on studies into the Gulf. Um, and now just you know, trying to, uh, trying to really focus, trying to use the energy in my experience and, and, and knowledge to, uh, for, for, for a greater good, either on a, say, on an advocacy, on a legal aspect, but also from a, from a research perspective. So one thing that I'm, I'm particularly fascinated at the moment is, is the role and an activity of state security entities. Uh, this is something I'm going to try and move forward with, but it's, it's, you know, it's impossible to do this, but it's also then even more crucial to, to investigate it because people do not understand how they work because there's a lack of evidence. Um, yes, you mentioned that you'd lived in, in the UAE and you obviously knew the, 
landscape very well, or at least you thought you did, because of course, when you were doing your field work, you, you obviously ran afoul of something. So had, in your view, I mean, you had lived there before, you thought you knew what was safe to do and ask, had the red lines shifted without anyone knowing? And a related question from Eduardo, did Durham approve your research and warn you that you might get into difficulties? Um, how did that transpire? So I obviously like as, as any academic, you'd have to fulfill a, an ethics and risk approval. Uh, this gets assessed internally. This gets approved by an insurer. Um, I have to acknowledge what risks there are. And so one of the things I did was I, I removed all MRT um, participants in interviews. So I only interviewed a uh, foreign expatriate personnel, all of which I have a, uh, had a good working relationship with. Um, in terms of those red lines, there had certainly been a change in the, I, I hadn't been in the country for three years and there had the atmosphere um, had really changed. And th this was um, so largely a byproduct of, of the war in Yemen, the, the stress, the war fatigue that was occurring within society, uh, maybe, na maybe not publicly, but at least within certain uh, people within the state. This then trickled down uh, into the security organizations who are then looking at ways of enhancing and expanding their own control and authority. Um, I, 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 I put my, my experience and what happened as part of that, that it was a, an eager uh, state security uh, individual somewhere that wanted to, to make a point um, and they decided to do this as opposed to anything else. Because um, no, nothing else really makes sense uh, at this point. <laughs> yeah. Well, of course, you were then, uh, I mean, in a sense, the Emiratis didn't back down. They, they doubled down, they convicted you, they sentenced you to life in prison on the charge of being a spy for, I think, MI6, based on a, a rank that doesn't exist, which uh, I think maybe reflected the sense that they were casting around for, for something that would stick. But you were then, of course, pardoned, and thankfully you were returned to the UK. I remember doing a, a BBC interview as you landed, and the interviewer was able to give live confirmation that you had arrived back. But what does it mean that you've been pardoned? Do you have a record now? This is a gift from Eduardo. Are you able to travel without any issues, for example, to the US? Do you have any ongoing difficulties but, relating to what happened to you? Legally? I can travel. Um, but you also have to be, you have to be responsible personally. Um, I, of course, I'm not gonna try and go to, um, know any countries within the Middle East North African region um, apart from Israel if I had to um, I wouldn't go to China I wouldn't go to Russia you, you name a country where someone who's been convicted of espionage um, on, on behalf of the UK government it doesn't matter if it's true or not um, the, the difficulties that I would face there um, you have to think of your own personal safety and that of, of, of your family but if you all the people that I, I, I know, all the people I knew as, as sources, as, as friends, as whoever it is, they have the, the damage from my experience has then also trickled down to them. It's so like radio, radioactivity. So I've had uh, friends and sources uh, interrogated by state security, by intelligence officers in their own countries. One person was even, you know, he was uh, shot at his car uh, tires and engine they 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 targeted him to try and kidnap him um, but he escaped and this is uh the, the the scariest thing is they either knew what they were doing they knew it was false but they they went ahead with it anyway which shows that that real strength of an assertiveness or they genuinely believed what was happening and they didn't have the ability to critically think and both situations are, are Quite dangerous but also illustrative of, of where we stand uh, today in this security oriented uh, UAE. And maybe just one final question before we wrap up. Um, maybe if you could just talk about your attempts to 
get some accountability for what happened, give a quick update on what you're doing and where you stand. So we have a, a civil case in the UK. Um, this is, there'll be developments on this uh, quite soon. Um, we have an ombudsman case against the Foreign Office, which uh, is beyond frustrating. Um, but again, we should be hearing, uh, this was supposed to be, we were, heard, were supposed to have heard back in around December, but this is, we're in the final stages now, the Foreign Office has, has tried to ask for ministerial um, protection or something, I, I don't know exactly what it was, but um, we'll hear more about that uh, soon. And then we have filed for, for several criminal cases based on universal jurisdiction, as the UA is a, is a signatory to the Convention Against uh, Torture. Um, However, this has been uh, picked up by an investigative prosecutor in France. Um, and this is, uh, this can, this chooses to be um, deemed legitimate. This is uh, useful because the, uh, one of the persons involved in my case is now the president of Interpol. And as a result, he has to travel to France uh, quite often. And, and if the judge decides it to be valid, um, you can be, spoken to and questioned uh, about my case. But watch uh, this, uh, yeah. watch, watch this space. Case. Yes. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Matt. And thank you very much for everybody who uh, attended this meeting. The meeting has been recorded and a recording will be available on the Kabul website, I think, and on uh, various other uh, Kabul related means. Uh, with that, I would like to thank you, Matt, for, for your talk and, of course, for, for everything you've gone through. I'd like to, to say how good it is to see you here and doing so. Being able to finish your PhD and to have published this book, I think it's, a, it's an achievement for anybody, but especially after what you had to, to go through, I think it's an incredible achievement. Um, Joseph has put a link to the book in the chat, and I would encourage everyone to go and take a look. It was published before NBZ became head of state, but it really lays out the groundwork for, for what we might expect in the UAE going forward. So with that, thanks again, Matt, and thank you all for coming and uh, have a good afternoon. Thank you very much, everyone, for